Gnome backpedals like their rear end is on fire, and Raptor CS cranked the power to nine. Electron is the future we deserve, and what do Linux apps mean for Chrome OS? And uh, Challenger has appeared in the Universal Package Race. We're going to talk about that nonsense in a hot second. And I managed to sneak not one, but two car stories into this week's episode, along with a little something for the gamers. But it's another great day for Linux, everyone. So let's go. Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we like to sit back, relax, and talk about some of the neat things going on in the world of floss. I'm Vin Stone, joined every week. That is Jill, Hollywood Jilly Noah, and Space LA, and Britannia, chiming in himself. One Pedro Matias. What is going on, people? It's another fantastic week for us to uh, get to do this. So it's always a fun time. Yes. Something we enjoy. <laughs> and uh, what's been good on since last week, Jill? It looks like uh, you've been uh, torturing... Poor innocent <laughs> souls with Linux. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I still still work. I'm on sabbatical, but I still work on Mondays and, and do a class. And I showed my students Monday how to boot a live Linux USB and run Blender and the GIMP, GIMP directly from their flash drives. And every semester that I do this, it, all the students are just like, how come other, other teachers don't show us this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like this is amazing. I mean, it actually, you can boot uh, Ubuntu Mate with the GIMP in Blender faster than you can load up 3D Studio for Windows. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty awesome. And the fact that you can run these apps from a flash drive is amazing. Got to dig so it. It's spreading really always, love, yeah. spreading yes, Linux. Yes, spreading the love, spreading the Linux love, and they all love it. <laughs> Pedro, Pedro, are you keeping everyone on the island in check? Eh, uh, Sort of. Uh, I'm at least keeping the uh, courier uh, services in check, especially if they don't deliver my stuff. But uh, kudos to Royal Mail. They delivered the uh, replacement motherboard for the ThinkPad X240. It's still in the plastic. It's a bit uh, old. It's it's seen some love, definitely. But it's in much better condition than the, uh, the one that's currently in this uh, little laptop right here. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, they'll be going in there after we're done with the show <laughs> not much to report over here aside from almost having to replace a very expensive lawnmower ties but that's a story for a different time uh, <laughs> I've been audio stuff man i got a gang yeah. of um xlr yeah i basically bought mono prices like how many you got given to me we're going to be reworking some stuff and make mix minus a lot easier so it's going to be also easier for us to bring on guest which is so I'm just like, well, bring on guests because like, it's a holy nightmare Yay. that's why but uh, hey we're here for you this show is because of patreon goal and we made it so we want to do that for you um let's get right into it so we don't drag on too long last week we i think we all collectively agreed that uh, the gnome project did something just a little boneheaded and mm -hmm. they, they removed the oh, yeah. <laughs> ability to launch scripts and executables from nautilus correct correct and uh well it, it kind of you know two steps forward three steps back man because it turns out people yeah. who use their systems they tend to do more than you know post screenshots on the internet and they, they kind of need these wacky things or a wacky thing called basic functionality <laughs> and uh they, they've reverted it to allow running binaries and scripts. They said this, okay, our bad. Uh, they, they mentioned enterprise <coughs> customers. They're like, hey, we, we have a problem with it. And to me, maybe uh -huh. I'm just reading the wrong tea leaves, but I, I kind of read that as um, the sponsors of the mm -hmm. GNOME project also equal, equal um, enterprise customers. Like, really? We, we can't use them anymore? This is not the thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Jill. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about this last week and uh, Pedro had a wonderful statement. He said, you know, this is expected functionality that was already there and you don't just take it away. It's something we've been using for years. And, you know, no, learn from this mistake and please don't take features away. They, they do this occasionally and it's really annoying. <laughs> so that's just that's just not good. You know, there are those of us yeah, who like and, to use the Nautilus browser and other other DMs as well. <laughs> yeah, and it was a significant enough bit of basic functionality 
that uh, yeah, of, of all the features that GNOME removed when the uh, when they moved from GNOME two to GNOME three, this this was the one that there was enough outcry from the community that got them to backpedal, backpedal to the point that they actually reverted See, the this, change. This makes me argue <laughs> with you just a little bit, Pedro, because when you say outcry a community, the GNOME project, will, I think, would happily turn around and go, "We don't respond to such things." <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair, yeah. but uh, <laughs> no, it, it was like the radical uh, change that happened when they moved from GNOME 2 to GNOME 3 to the point where there's now cinnamon and mate and, I don't know, there's probably even more, like Pantheon, that's also GTK 3 based. Uh, there were enough projects that forked themselves out of the GNOME base just so they could keep that bit of functionality. Uh, and GNOME did not backtrack at all back then. And now, because they decided to force people to open up the terminal, just right-click open terminal, uh, yeah, no, they went back <laughs> on their decision. Hmm. <laughs> good on you, GNOME. You're listening now. Yes. Took you long enough. Awesome. But... That's good to see. And, hey, uh, no, I, I have not seen anyone come back and... Because you know there were people defending that. They're like, no, you just don't understand the greater vision. Now they've changed back, poof, you know, a smoke bomb. Never said anything. Uh, mm -hmm. Jill, you you yeah. seem to have a big thing about this power yes. stuff, man. <laughs> Would anyone out there like a, a less expensive uh, Power 9 IBM processor? Mm. Well, now you can obtain one. And um, you can get one now for under fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> I um, you can customize it with all the works, and and that's where about <laughs> I just it would, just was under fifteen thousand, and it is completely enhanced for Linux, and the firmware is open source and and can be completely edited all the way down to the CPU microcode. So that's one of the 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 unique things about this particular RISC processor. Um, is it's one of the, one of the ones that's open. And, so we're talking about um, a company, Raptor Computing <laughs> Systems, that has a system available for purchase, right? Yes. Oh yeah, definitely. It's and, it's only a pre-order. Ah. <laughs> yeah, this one's pre-order, and the reason why this one is cheaper because it only comes with one processor slot, and um, which cuts the price way down because the other other version of this, the Telus Two, has two processors. And um, yeah, Katana still, Steel, uh, you know, the base cost is still fourteen hundred dollars. Yes, I know. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you, you were saying Katana pointed out in our show notes that you yeah. can get a twenty-two core Power Nine for the low, low price of twenty-five hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But you know, th this is actually pretty huge because you know it, it is it is com was competing with the um, uh, deck alphas and the spark risks and the and the uh, silicon graphics mips and um, it's it's really nice to have a high-end workstation level processor that's less than 20 grand and I actually have <laughs> I went through a little bit of effort I um, I had a power 7 motherboard mm -hmm. and I extracted the heat sink and processor so I could show it. I spent a lot of money on this but I never finished uh building this rig. And this is a, a 16 core um uh 16 core uh 3 gigahertz processor. And it cost me quite a bit of money but I never fi finished the system. So and I do have every risk system represented in this room, including a deck alpha behind me, a mm -hmm. SunSpark, and a, a Silicon Graphics. Mips. Now, one thing uh, I got to ask is outside of um, <laughs> uh, electronic mm -hmm. organized hoarding or collecting, <laughs> collecting as it's known in modern culture, is uh, <laughs> what's the use case outside of like, because seriously, like, hey, Vin, do you want a Power 9? Absolutely, I do. Uh, what are you going to use it for? Look, I have a power rendering. nine system. I will <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, rendering and big data—that would be my uses. <laughs> mm. I'd, I'd use it as a new render render workstation. Okay, be so awesome. enterprise uh, enterprise level use for the most part. All right, exactly. Uh, I was looking through the uh, the spec list. It's like, oh, 
oh, it's actually got two 4.0 PCIe slots. Mm -hmm. And um, it's got eight slots of DDR4 RAM, which supports 16 gigabyte DIMMs. Uh, If you've uh, looked at the uh, 16 gigabyte uh, DDR4 DIMMs available uh, on sale right now, you've probably come to the uh, realization that getting the full 128 gigabytes of ddr4 RAM that this system can take will cost you more than the system itself oh yeah yes. ecc ram yes, is will. always quite expensive <laughs> yes <laughs> i don't know i mean granted this is like super enthusiast they want this for you know unless you have a use case for it it is slightly affordable it's better than what what was that board only we were looking at uh several months oh back. the uh um... yeah the power eight uh one uh, it might as well have been called the power uh, whoa that's too much for that piece of kit uh, yeah, yeah it was yeah. almost five thousand dollars for just the uh, the motherboard so you can walk yes. into this uh, <laughs> if you're power curious that's almost a show title um so let's say you love risk yes. uh, but you want it in a more portable form factor yeah risk well of- this is an open source laptop running a risk five workstation level processor and um, it's in the works and that would be wonderful. Um, it's much more powerful than the arm based risk laptops of today. <laughs> and it will be very expensive of course, because this is an ent- enterprise level processor. Yes, it's risk. And um, so this is a really, really, uh, um, uh, would be an awesome, awesome way to have a workstation, a portable workstation. <laughs> it is. So they've put together a working group, a uh, RISV laptop working group, and all this is going to be in our show notes. So they currently have a draft uh, for the ISA specifications, uh, user level ISA specs, and people are just getting together because for some reason they want a risk based laptop. But man, when was the last time we saw that? Like a clamshell Mac? Yeah, uh, yeah. The power PC. Probably the power PCs were the last mm. ones. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I like the idea, but uh, if uh, the Power Eight and Power Nine architectures taught us anything, is that uh, risk-based architectures are very much a niche product, and the people who use them are probably willing and have the means to pay the uh, the niche. Uh, tech price but yeah uh jill uh asked in the notes uh, it's, uh, how much would this laptop cost and i'm betting at least five thousand yeah. dollars for the lowest end version at least minimally anything like that i mean this is some people getting together I, in the show notes I, I called it risk laptop fanfic because yes <laughs> yeah it's a good idea i don't think we'll it's risky fanfic indeed <laughs> Not much of a case well, to say, well, you're looking at a limited yeah. user case for just like risk on the desktop currently, because I know some people are like, shut up, old man, Vin, the, you know, power is the future, and which, you know, you could probably convince me of that. <laughs> but currently, like not right now, and especially in a laptop format. But hey, man, it's good to be ahead of the curve. Let's talk about our favorite thing in the world, Electron. Yes, let's talk about the future. The future, as Jill uh, so eloquently put it at the start of the show, we deserve. And it looks a lot like Chrome, or uh, the Chrome Embedded uh, Framework, or as it's more uh, colloquially known, uh, Electron. Uh, The Verge had a bit of an article, and they titled it, The Desktop Belongs to Electron. And yes, we have been making this joke uh, on this very show for a while. Everything is going to be Electron <laughs> in the future. Uh, it uh, might as well come to grips with it. You're going to need at least 32 gigabytes of RAM to run a desktop environment and two or three applications. And you can't probably open like 20 tabs in Chrome because you'll run out of RAM at that point. But yeah, it's uh, Electron is... It's here. It's certainly made a name for itself. Most of the um, common, most commonly used applications uh, are already running Electron. Heck, we're using one of those right now. We're using Discord for the show. So mm-hmm. there is definitely some um, merit to Electron if the developer that's working with it knows what they're doing or is brave enough to risk doing a couple of things hey man Uh, you say that and listen discord is a shining example of what can be done with electron i'll give you mm -hmm. that 100 percent. but 
Uh, pull up HTOP right now and see, see how much RAM you need to have a chat client up and running. Um, but yeah. you know, but it's over a gig. Electron, you know, yeah. is everything these days. <laughs> but we don't have to worry about that because, you know, RAM's so cheap these days, right, John? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, it, all of these Electron apps should be working great in Linux because reasons. It's It's based off of Chromium OS. I mean... Come on, people. Well, listen, <laughs> and, I, I'm saying you're you right know. on that. Yes, it is very easy to use Electron. And listen, and we are beating a dead horse. Go watch our Saturday show. We've been beating that horse for six years. <laughs> uh, what I do want to say about it, though, is, you know, it, it runs fine. It is wicked easy to do. They made a point in that little video we were looking at from The Verge. And, like, there's hundreds of thousands of programs. Because this baby's first, hey, look, I can write once and it works everywhere. It didn't work for Java. Uh, but... At the cost of increased CPU, RAM, and most importantly, battery usage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, uh, I remember when Flash was the hot new thing. Uh, every single website that I went to back in the early knots mm. was just Flash or Shockwave. You oh, have you to have sweet the Shockwave summer plugin. child. I remember <laughs> Shockwave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, that all came crashing down, and to the point where Adobe is saying, "Yeah, we're going to defos for real this time. Uh, going to kill Flash by 2020. I'll believe it when I see it." Um, and I really don't want to go back through the dark ages of the web where everything was Flash and just opening up a website took sometimes more than a minute. Of just loading all <laughs> yeah. the flash stuff. Well, so let's listen, not man, let that happen again. I, I don't know if that's necessarily like, a, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen again. A Electron, it's built using open source components, it's built using Chromium and the like, unlike Flash, because, you know, that was a closed environment by Adobe, and even Adobe's like, kill this thing, please. Mm -hmm. And we want rid of it now. <laughs> most everyone has. Thank you, Apple. You did that. I, you do have to give Apple credit for not putting, you know, Barry <laughs> Allen on the iPhone. Yeah. 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 And that just started that <laughs> snowball rolling. So, um, Pedro, you have a Chrome book, Franken book that you, well, you bought one. Yes, I did. Yeah. I bought the Acer R11. Uh, it's, before, it's got the flip yeah. hinge. And before that, yeah. you'd, you'd kind of hacked one together. But um, the next piece, Tech Republic. What Linux, what do Linux apps, see, it's hard to even say, it's not right. Mm -hmm. Linux apps on Chrome OS, what, what does it mean for open source? Uh, I don't know what it means for open source, and to be honest, neither does the author of this particular article. Ooh, uh, shots fired. So, <laughs> he, he, uh, he tried uh, the uh, GNOME app, uh, the GNOME app, no, the Linux app functionality on Chrome OS, and... He was using the Pixel 2 laptop. Uh, um, it's the uh, the second run of the really, really expensive, really, really, really overpriced Chromebook. And he had some success with it. There are a couple of applications that don't work so well. And the thing here is, and the thing that confuses me the most, uh, is it it's Chrome OS. It's already a Linux admittedly a very uh, customized one, but it's already a Linux distribution of sorts. So why is it so hard to uh, get regular uh, Linux applications working on it? I mean, it's really not that hard. We've seen what Crouton can do. It just set up a ch root, load X, boom, you got your applications running. But this one, it's uh, Crostini, as they call it. Uh, they are actually virtualizing the environment that the application runs. Uh, it's uh, like a full-on container with VM functionality and whatnot to basically isolate that application from the rest of Chrome OS. And, okay, people who want Chrome OS to work like Chrome OS does, just to do the basic stuff like web browsing, videos, uh, emails, whatnot, they're not going to worry about those Linux apps. So why bother isolating them as much as they are right now when that, as it is, introduces a non-negligible There's a couple overload. of things you got to look at here, man. First, yeah. uh, <laughs> the author of this ran it with a Pixel 2 laptop. All right. Mm -hmm. You can call that a Chromebook if you want. No, that's a <laughs> high-end laptop. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, the, this entire thing, man, running Linux apps on Chromebooks, yeah, if, you, if you're running it on a $1,000 laptop, you know what? You're going to have a mediocre to mildly not so bad yeah. experience. 
you try to pull this on a $200 Chromebook, it's going to be junk. It's going to be bad. Yeah. And it kind of, to me, defeats the point of having a Chromebook. Um, then again, we, we got to think about like Google's moving away from Linux. The neck, the, uh, Fuchsia. Yeah. That's, that's not yeah. Linux, man. So yep. I don't know where that's going to go. Do you have any thoughts on this, Joe? Yeah. Well, I'm hoping this will bring a much wider audience uh, to using Linux apps. And the author of the article, Jack Willen, says that Christini will be pointless to the average user if Linux apps aren't easy to install via software repository or Google Play. Uh, most users won't open a terminal and app to get installed. I kind of disagree with them. I think this is a good opportunity <laughs> to teach the average person about using a terminal. So, I, I would I, argue, you know. argue that the average person <laughs> shouldn't even know the word terminal. No, yeah. they, they just keep <laughs> well, them away from too. that because that's just going to cause would, more animosity. Now, I understand like the need well, and the want to educate people. Trust me, I do. Yeah. But when it, <laughs> when it comes to a general compute device, what, that's what a Chromebook's trying to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that, that's true. That's it, it, true. It it's just that big shiny you know. icons like an idiocracy <laughs> at the hospital. That's that's what I'm looking for. Uh, we learned yeah. all this stuff in the early years of computing, so I, I think we need to get back to that. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> we moved away from that for a reason. Just saying. Uh, <laughs> <aww. laughs> no. Hey, I, I know, but it's good to know. But that's specialized knowledge. Uh, let's talk about yeah. this. Look at uh, mm-hmm. Tarballs, the ultimate container image format. Let's get into this holy war. Um, GUIX. Oh. Yeah, it's thing. And I was reading through this. I was like, wait a minute. This is Slack packs. You're, you're not fooling me, which is really not. <laughs> kind of the same idea. Um, you know, here's the problem. <laughs> yes, this is another thing in the vein of app image, snap packs. And it doesn't matter what it is. Snap, app, flat, you name it. Uh, everything is competing with the incumbents, uh, the Debs, RPMs, Rs, and stuff like that. And the biggest issue with those is all of those have this horrible, horrible superpower of being good enough. Have you ever tried to pick a fight? Have you ever tried to pick a fight (laughs) and beat good enough, Pedro? It is a hard war to win. You're like, no, you you need to install my thing. And it's like, but what I have is good enough. You're like, but my thing does the... Things that, well, are you saying mine's like horribly broken and insecure? No, it's good enough, but my thing you need to install. I mean, it's a hard argument, son. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, that's probably why snaps and flat packs and uh, app images are still so mm-hmm. few and far between. It's, yeah, okay, devs and RPMs and the uh, AUR and all the other packaging systems that distros currently use right now. They have their flaws, certainly, but they are established. They've been around long enough that people know what to do with them, know what to expect. And yeah, introducing a whole new format, it's, you know, XKCD 927 all over again. But the way that this one is implemented, uh, GUIX, it's it's interesting. It's uh, far more modular and it's actually cross-compatible with... uh, uh, other uh, packaging systems, including these universal packages. Uh, it's, uh, they give an example in the article saying that, yes, you can just extract this particular tarball and have it be loadable as a Docker container. Mm-hmm. That's pretty neat. You have one yeah. uh, simple mm-hmm. package that will support all of the container systems. But that's still yeah. not ideal because you have one more uh, packaging format that granted, it supports all the others, but it's one more on top of that. It's like XKCD 927 meets Inception. Well, the bit of news from this is, yeah. uh, the way you're talking about this, we all know that GUIX is a thing. Yeah, but they've added the relocatable option, so you no longer have to install this in its own little um, root directory or where it wants. I mean, you can it can intelligently link itself, and mm-hmm. it will, you know, it'll produce the tarballs in the automatically relocatable binaries. This is good. You know, you no longer have to do it in your root file system. Look, I actually hit the mic. Um, that's neat because you, you don't have to play tricks with the, you know, unshare command or anything like that. And here's what I like, though. This is what I like. Right at the end of the article, uh, GUIX packs are bit reproducible. That means anyone can rebuild them to ensure they do not contain 
malware, hashtag oh snap, hashtag shots fired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is yeah, pretty well, this... good. Going... Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jill. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, this just makes totally sense to me. Um, uh, tarballs have been around since the early days of Unix computing, so it makes sense that this would be packaged for for that use. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's move on to that. To Tesla releases some of its software to comply with open source licenses. This makes me happy because better late than never. Am I right? Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the copyright holders have been complaining that Tesla has not been complying with their license. This is a true story. This is their first step toward Tesla fulfilling their legal obligations. Good on you. And what have they done? They've released two of their GitHub repos. Uh, What's it going to be used for? Well, the source code is going to be useful for Tesla owners with root access to the car. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you can root a Tesla. Why do you think I want one? Why do you think I'm getting one? <laughs> um, I, I say this is good. This this is progress. And uh, who was it that was deaf on their system? Uh, the Software Freedom Conservancy. You know, and they were like, yo, you need yes. to fix this. And Tesla's like, yo, we're trying to fix this. You know, here's the fig leaf, and they seem to be cool with what they've done so far and looking forward to open. And this is kind of a problem with stuff under the GPL because you need to legally mm -hmm. share any modifications that you've done with that. And that's why you see a lot of BSD licensing, stuff like Apple, where you don't yeah. have to share anything. And yeah. um, mm -hmm. I, I just thought it was nice to see that they were doing this. Yeah, and it's good to see mm -hmm. uh, that at least they did it sooner, later, whatever, they're doing it. So that's something that's more than certain other projects uh, have done. Lightworks, Minecraft, a few others. Oh, my, uh, you can't. All yeah. right. You know, I'm not defending Lightworks, but a different company owns them now than yeah. the company that made the promise. Now that for a long time, the same company that said, man, we're going to open source everything. For a long time, that was the same company that never released the source. But now... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somebody bought what was left of it, and they're like, oh, let's see what we can do and, with it. Uh, to your point there, Vin, I like the idea of having a, um, a four-wheel toy that will wrap you around the first three at the first chance it gets. Sweetheart, uh, sweet, are, you, are, 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 are you familiar with the cars I currently own? Aww. <laughs> sure, but you, uh, then I started thinking, it's like, oh yeah, you already have the one responsible car, why would you want two? This one is clearly a toy. <laughs> This is a toy, man. I've been saving for a Tesla for six years, yes. man. So, and it, it's very depressing when, like, they came out. Elon was like, "Yeah, it's gonna be a little while before we make that thirty-five thousand dollar Model Three. And I was like, "I oh, know, probably gonna be like three more years." Um, <laughs> Renault, we're both on the waiting list, and man, I am nowhere near. Because you know, I'm getting the base model. That's the one I want. I don't want the fancy mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, cool. That's cool. <laughs> Open source. Okay. Yeah. Good Elon. Pat on head. Uh, yes. This mm -hmm. is this is a bold, gosh darn claim, Pedro. Yes. Yes, it is. So um, there's a bit of an article on OMG Ubuntu that says free office 2018 released with open quotes, complete support, close quotes for Microsoft Office files. Yes, it is another uh, office suite. This one, uh, the free version at least only includes a PowerPoint type uh, slideshow presentation thing. Uh, it's got a text editor that the top is uh, red instead of blue, just to confuse things, and a spreadsheet editor like you'd expect. Uh, it's got the basic three, and you know, I was skeptical uh, when I read the article title and I went through the articles like, oh, okay, they actually claim that uh, they can make it happen and it's not open source. It's free. Uh, I guess the expression would be free as in beer. I don't know where Stallman's been getting his beer, but uh, I won't be some of that. No, no, you uh, meant free <laughs> as in beard. Oh, oh okay. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so... To its credit, I did download it, I installed it, mm -hmm. and I threw one of the most complex spreadsheets that I created at work just to, you know, create that little bit of uh, automation, quote-unquote, inside Excel just to make my life easier uh, whenever I have to compile some matter of report, and everything worked. Well, the font rendering wasn't great, but that's when I realized, oh yeah, I don't have the Microsoft fonts installed. Once I installed those, Everything worked 
really, really well. So it, it even respected like cell sizes and the custom formatting that I have in that uh, particular spreadsheet. So good job there, free office. Mm -hmm. Right job. on, Jill. You gave yeah. it a spin too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I actually was really quite impressed with it. It runs fast and the file size is actually smaller than LibreOffice and it uses less memory. Hmm. So um, I ran top on it and uh, that and Libra and there was quite a difference. And it's just nice to have another office suite that that works well under Linux. And um, but what's interesting <laughs> is when you launch it, you can uh, you can launch the uh, theme or customization of the app. And uh, they have the Microsoft ribbon menu option. Oh, really? <laughs> like, why would anyone want to pick that? <laughs> Didn't Microsoft it's the default? <laughs> no. mm. um, so if it's going to get 100% compatibility, is, is there a flight yes. simulator hidden, hidden spreadsheets? Oh, yes. <laughs> or a clip. Go down to know. sell 26 million whatever mm. and uh, type in the code. <laughs> True story, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, what do we got up next? A uh, little bit of gaming, actually, man. Just just yes. a bit. Pack Vim, uh, CLI game yeah. to learn Vim commands. Waka waka, ladies and gentlemen. It's exactly what it is. Uh, <laughs> oh mm -hmm. man, I don't know why you'd want to do this to yourself. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, this came out I mean, a few years ago, actually, and and I used it to refresh my Vim command skills. It was it's very well done and, and really actually kind of fun. <laughs> I I'm, just, I'm looking at the screenshots. It's like, oh, that's what hell looks like. Um, <laughs> it's there. It runs on eighteen oh four. So so what's the base of it? I mean, uh, does it have like you? It, it, it does Jigsaw show up and it's like, would you like to play a game? And Oh, oh, what's going on, Jill? Tell me about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, you run it, and then you you try and um, edit edit words to conform to the uh, templates for Vim, the shortcuts. <laughs> so, um, actually, I haven't ran it in a while. <laughs> well, I'm so, looking at it, and, uh, and I need to. <laughs> you use Q to, to quit the game, which I, I'll say is definitely yeah. a good thing. Uh, I just wanted to <laughs> easy that. mode. Yeah. Hey, somebody go try this. I don't hate myself enough to try this. I'm sorry to be short on information, everyone. But if you, yeah. if you want to taste that nightmare, uh, do it. S send us a note. Let, let us know that it, that experience <laughs> went. I'll, I'll stick with using Nano or uh, Gedit because I'm not going to lie. Once yeah. I figured out Gedit did syntax highlighting, uh, I use it a lot. It's a real thing. Yeah, I use nano or gedit but sometimes I, I like to go back and refresh my vim skills so i need to do, run this again because i <laughs> i remember it was really quite effective and it gets actually very very hard <laughs> so um, as, as as the words go away <laughs> let's do this real quick since we're on the vim train 8.1 is also available what does this bring it does bring one interesting piece of kit which is the main new feature of vim supporting will support for running a terminal in a vim window that's kind of neat, you know. Uh, you can basically compile stuff, take a look, see where it's noping, and cool? Question mark. Uh, it seems a bit. Uh, what's the word for it? Unnecessary, since uh, all the uh, GUI editors already have that type of functionality built in. At least the major ones do. What if you're not using like a GUI yeah. editor and Jigsaw right. actually did show up and he says you can only open one terminal? And yeah. Well, Vim is used uh, okay. by so many people, so. <laughs> and, it's a new uh, version of is, Vim. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to give it a mention. I'm sure people who use it already know yeah. this. Like, this is old news. Uh, well, it's not really old news, but I just thought it was yeah. neat. That was something I think, who was it? Artherin threw that Arthurin. into the notes. Yeah. All right. Before we get out of here, let's discuss something that is not going to happen this year. <laughs> Correct. Uh uh, well, uh, Canonical has talked about going IPO, but it's going to take its its time doing so, which is a good thing. And uh, Mark Shuttleworth knows uh, we need he he we know what we need to hit in terms of revenue and growth, and we're on track. And of course, getting rid of Ubuntu Phone and the Unity Desktop was the first thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Shuttleworth said Canonical's focus now will be on cloud infrastructure. Yeah, <laughs> which yeah, <laughs> that, that that that's what threw me off. An initial public offering. Yeah, yeah we're talking about stock. They've been trying to lean it down. You know, they uh, yes. 
<laughs> like seriously cut some weight. You know, they killed a, uh, what was it? Mir. Poor Mir. Yeah. Mir yeah, died in a fire. Yeah, the, yeah and, Mir died um, in a fire. Kumbuntu phone. A uh, bunch yeah. of like projects that I didn't hate because I was glad somebody was doing something different, even though it was a stupid different. It was still different. Yeah. And it made people, yeah. you know, competition's good. Um, but, you know, trimming it down, they, they lost some people. to do that. They're still focusing on the desktop, but they are, yeah, moving into, uh, well, hopeful, I should say, for the future of IoT and you know, Internet of Things and the Ubuntu Core Snap Management System to help manage all that business to, I, I don't know, if you're watching the video version, you could see I had IoT highlighted because that's where I stopped and laughed out loud. Um, <laughs> just because that, it's like, I don't know if that's such a good idea, guys. But I do want to say this because they want to get into cloud business. And I, I, well, what do you think, Joe? What do you think, Pedro? Am I just being negative in more so than normal? Uh, when I say the, really the only way that they're going to get into, you know, that arena with, is with a time machine. Uh, <laughs> There's yeah. probably well, enough room mm. for them to find their own niche mm. it's it's a big world <laughs> yeah considering that it's one of the largest distros in enterprise yeah it, it'll yeah. find its its way not on server it'll side find, then definitely. you got to deal with microsoft <laughs> linux which is a strange thing to say too I'm like yeah. yes yeah. <laughs> you're yeah you're going to have to be competing with uh with azure but the thing that uh really struck me was back before they announced their IPO, uh, Canonical's thing was, oh, design, and we're going to make the desktop experience as... Um, Brown as possible. Well, <laughs> 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 I was going to say as mainstream, uh, mainstream as possible, because they were very clearly trying uh, to compete with Apple. And now this was an interesting shift to see. It's like the moment they the, they have their IP, uh, they announce their IPO. It's like, oh yeah, Unity is going away, Mirror is going away, um, Ubuntu Phone is going away, and instead we're going to focus on the Internet of Things and mm -hmm. the cloud and whatnot. It's like, oh, so you went from trying to be Apple to trying no. to be <laughs> Docker. No, they, they went from um, <laughs> a company interested in doing neat stuff to a company that wants to make money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, well, that's for yeah. In, in their defense, actually, before they were trying to become Apple, they were doing more cloud-like things. You, you could, you actually had a, I had a cloud account with, <laughs> with Canonical at one time that they, yeah, that they was stopped the Ubuntu before one, the, one, one. Yeah. Yeah, one yeah, one accounts. Yeah. So, I mean, they, and that was years ago. That was in early GNOME days of the desktop. <laughs> That's the thing. So, yeah, yeah, 2018 will not be the year of the uh, Linux IPO for uh, Ubuntu nope. or the likes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I look forward to, uh, I mean, I like Shuttleworth. Uh, I think he's a very direct yeah. person, and I can respect that. And it'll be interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see where they end up and how everything yes. shakes down. And he didn't make it clear. He's like, we're not forgetting the desktop. So, which is good because I'm still yeah. going, yeah, that, that new LTS. We're still tapping the brakes on that one. All the bugs have not been <laughs> worked out. I uh, want to take a few seconds to thank all the lovely people making this show possible, uh, our beautiful patrons. And mm -hmm. uh, if you want to support this nonsense, help us out. This is, uh, as we do like to say, a charity in every way but the paperwork, because that's a lot of paperwork. Um, we have a couple ways you can do that with patreon.com, LibrePay. we got Amazon affiliate links. Thank you to everyone shopping through that. We have a wish list. I'll talk about that in a second. New York affiliate links. Humble man, uh, you know, Pedro, we've not sold a lot of book. No, oh, say it right, <laughs> we've not, not a lot of games, but people buy a lot of books through a humble partner. Thing. Yeah, go figure. Uh, we have an audience of uh, geeky people who like to learn things. <laughs> I didn't know so whenever yes. a new bundle comes out to learn, especially something related to programming or something along those lines, people tend to buy it a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hey man, I'm just jelly of anyone who can read. Um, <laughs> but thank you for that. We do want to thank 113 beautiful patrons kicking us $249 per Saturday night because we work, we dance for our coin. If you got four quarters a week that you can spare, we don't do the monthly thing because you don't have to do anything. You're just like every month, money just shows up. 
We only get paid when we produce, and we do produce a lot. We do five live streams each week, up to and including this show, which we hope you enjoy, which started as a Patreon goal. Look at that. Pedro's horrible playhouse ziggurat. <laughs> it's a junk show. Don't watch it. Oh, uh, no. Have a bad, what you want to do is... Um, Watch the uh, better show that's airing this Friday, <laughs> Fubar, which is uh, trivia night. We have a brand new Jack Pack that we're going to be throwing in and you can join in for that. And Yay. the Canadians, Sandy and Jordan, they play some turn-based game on Tuesdays. Hopefully we get a little bit for everyone. I don't know. Uh, I got to quit hitting. I got to remap buttons. Um, <laughs> thanks, everyone. If you want to join us on Patreon and you do get some stuff back, uh, you can join us in Discord where we're hanging out the other six days of the week. But we do want to thank our latest patrons, Matt K. Yishan, welcome Yay. back. And uh, Yay, Yishan. I, I got to throw Maddie a little bit of love. Our, uh, my yes. favorite Canadian. Mm-hmm. That's right, Jordan. Maddie's my favorite Canadian. Because <laughs> uh, we, we had a little thing show up. Actually, we were talking awesome. uh, a little thing called Love, Pedro. Why are you incapable of love? <laughs> no, the, the, this piece of kit showed up, and it's plugged in currently right now. Uh, I was talking with Maddie earlier today, and he's like, man, that shit fast. And I was like, yeah, I ordered one of these the same day, and his beat mine by day. What is it? You never heard of it? It is a, I guess I'll do a little bit of review. Uh, USB. XLR out. So it's a sound card with XLR outs. And I was like, oh, that sounds kind of neat. Yeah, but it has transformer isolation uh, and it has a ground lift. So if you have nice. any of that 60 cycle hum coming out of a sound card that you normally get with like 3.5 millimeter, gone. So we're able to, this one, uh, this is Pedro. Pedro's talking through it right now. Uh, Hello. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, listen, man, I, I, I hang on. <laughs> it I sounds even, good. <laughs> I, I have an action shot right there. See? Ooh. Yay. And, uh, Sweet. Jordan's will be showing up. Um, I think it's probably already showed up. I just got to plug it in. And it's a nice piece of kit uh, for 40 bucks. That's where things get interesting. So mm-hmm. that's the thing. Uh, Maddie, you did send in a little thing because you get to write something on our wish list gifts, and I'm forced to read them. Mm-hmm. So hopefully this isn't too bad. <laughs> Hi, Linux Gamecast. Mary, expletive deleted. Look, family show. Uh, 300 episodes from Mad Eye 19. Yeah, we hit 300 episodes, man. That's uh, 5. Yeah. 5. 5.7 years Yay. we've been covering Linux <laughs> gaming. Get off our lawns. Um, lawn. <laughs> okay, let's see. What is up next? Uh, slice pie? Sound good? Sound delicious? Yes. Oh, yes. Pretty and pie? Let's get into some pie. Ooh, <laughs> really pink pie. Yeah, I, I wouldn't nice. eat that. <laughs> <laughs> and as usual, we have uh, someone who found an older system and decided to increase its uh, performance by several orders of magnitude and in this case reduce the weight considerably yes someone actually put a raspberry pi inside an osborne one and uh, they also got the uh, seven inch touchscreen and a couple other things now there was one thing that was lacking in my opinion, when it comes to this video, a life. Uh, but it, <laughs> yes, there, <laughs> there's Aww. a definite uh, lack of a social life from the uh, the creator. But uh, you know, he did a lot of things right. He managed to make the screen fit in just nice with the uh, Osborne One cutout uh, for the little CRT that they had in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also managed to make the keyboard and transform that particular nightmare into a USB input that the Pi can talk to. Uh So the the keyboard works. The one thing that's missing is the uh, optical media drives. Uh, I was, uh, you know... What are you talking about? An Osborne (laughs) with optical media drives? Uh, Well, floppy disk drives. Floppy disks, yes. Less optical, more vibration. But more more uh, magnet. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, you know, last week I praised uh, the uh, the guy that made that old console work with the actual physical buttons and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So here I'm like, oh, oh, did he get the floppy drives to actually work now? No, they're they're Uh -uh. just for show. (laughs) So that needs to be a thing that they do that's definitely a thing i mean you could i now my brain's like yeah, yeah we could do that um with a raspberry Pi, who was it who put it out yeah massive Audi, yeah 18650s i would put like some 21700s in that thing and it would run for months new tesla batteries i got some on the way mm-hmm. uh, 
That I, what I was surprised about, Jill, was when yeah. the Alice Board won, when it debuted, it had the price tag equivalent of about five thousand dollars oh, yes. which doesn't <laughs> shock. I'm like, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's, that's uh, listen, that... expensive, but that's affordable ish, right? I mean, you can buy yeah. five thousand dollar laptops today, easy. Mm-hmm. Well, that's how much. Uh, a lot of computers cost back then <laughs> so so that was uh but portable ones uh that was you know it was the first of its kind and i i just checked ebay and um the the cheapest one you can find right now is 265 dollars, which actually is a steal they are usually 500 dollars and up for a working one so i'm almost i i I haven't told Steve husband, but I'm almost thinking of buying it because <laughs> i don't have an osborne one in my collection um, but what's nice is you can find, you can find ones as low as $120 and use a Pi and our Arduino like this project and get it up and running and upcycle an old computer, an old Osborne computer and get it working. Hmm. And, um, I have several of these so-called portable computers in my collection that were Osborne clones. And one is a rare Texas instrument, 90 pound beast that still works, but I may never find replacement parts for, because I have never seen it even on eBay. And if it ever dies and the power supply goes or motherboard, um, Raspi to the rescue, I will, I, I will upcycle that computer <laughs> and make it a little faster. <laughs> good to know. And yeah, uh, fortunately I, I never had to carry around luggables, but yeah. <laughs> to that extent, you could argue the business laptop that I had in throughout the 2000s was a luggable. I think it clocked it at like six and a half, seven freedom pounds. Yeah. So, yeah. Monsters back in the day. Plus the end, like nine batteries I carried with me when I was on airplanes because it would go through what? 45 minutes watching a DVD. Um, coming up next, uh, horror. Green means go. Red, stay in bed. That, that, that is not as kinky as it might sound, Pedro. No, no, it isn't. Uh, and uh, well, this is a an alarm clock of sorts uh, for kids, as they say. Uh, and basically, what it means is uh, it's got a Raspberry Pi uh, built into core, obviously, and uh, it, through some clever use of LEDs, uh, it shows up in green, and they say green means go, and red stay in bed. And I'm guessing the uh, mm-hmm. the yellow slash orange is for when you're already late. I'm gonna, now, I'm gonna uh, have to spoil yeah. Pedro here. That's an Arduino. <laughs> oh, it's an Arduino, Dan. Yeah, <laughs> Arduino Mini. Okay. Yeah, I, All I, right. I could understand uh, the confusion. It looks like a like a yeah. laptop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, one of the things. The thing that struck me the moment I uh, clicked to the article was the okay. So red means stay in bed. So imagine. You get yourself a kid, uh, that <laughs> wait, uh, wait, wait, particular wait. child. <laughs> but, but time out. <laughs> Phrasing, okay? You don't get yourself a kid. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Whichever the case may be, uh, let's say you have a child sleeping in your house, uh, and they wake up in the middle of the night, and you have this little light-up clock uh, on on their uh, bedside, and they look and they see this creepy little cat in red just shining, staring directly at them. Mm-hmm. I'm not entirely sure red was the best color for when you yeah. should go back to sleep. Red means stop. Ba means no. I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> They're children. Come on. They, 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 they don't have the traffic light thing built into their brains yet. Man, they, they'll learn. for the, Like, come on. It, it's green and red, Jill. Tell tell yeah. Pedro he's weird for being scared of the color red. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm wearing red right now. <laughs> booga, booga. <laughs> and make me a sandwich. Well, you see, that, that's so. the whole thing. Well, what, what you don't see is like lights on the chair. Every time I have like yes. full screen Pedro, he just like ducks down under his desk. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's, it's kind of neat. I mean, you know, yeah. mine only flashes red, so. But then again, it talks. Yeah. Now, if it talked, well, yeah, yeah, you could, <laughs> you, you could, could make uh, it talk. Program that, yeah, yeah if definitely. Could, if it, uh, can you imagine an adorable little kitty-looking thing screaming exterminate? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for kids, LGC cares. Well, um, I think this is really cute, actually, and I would make, I would make, 
Yeah, I'm I red is okay, but I think I probably would have used purple because it's 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 less annoying on the eyes at, at night. <laughs> but um but uh this is this is cool. It's a cheap way to make a color changing clock that little kids can read and enjoy. Mm. <laughs> and there's a cute kitty to boot. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, I have an app that does this on my Chumbi. <laughs> it does exactly this. It changes the colors of the screen depending on the time of day. And you can, you know, uh, hack it and play around with it <laughs> and write a script that changes the colors. And I, uh, some people had done this. They had actually done the, the red light, green light thing <laughs> on their Chumbies. And there was a template, a script for that. <laughs> I don't know. Feeling a old school. If I was somebody's house, I'm yeah. like, why is that changing color? Oh, it lets me know what time of day it is. I'm going to grab my umbrella, yeah. then I'm going to grab them by the wrist and drag them outside and be like, here, check this out. I need to get out. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it would be good also to teach your, your kid how to use an analog clock, like like we were taught when we were kids. And it'll be great. Then the kid will learn, you know, maybe a couple of fast switching diodes, and you're going to have like a little dance party. Oons, oons, yeah, oons. exactly. Like Pedro has. <laughs> Pedro has a watch, but don't tell him I told him it was a dance party. He doesn't know. Um, <laughs> tune your car with a Raspberry Pi. Yep, I uh, card, not even an analogy. OBD2 tablet. Don't read this article because they don't know what they're talking about because it starts right off. It's yeah. like every car has OBD2 ports. It's like, uh, no. Well, after yeah. 1996, every car does. But um, this is early stages. This is more about the code than the project. You know, somebody basically took, you know, the Pi screen, Pi case slapped it together, put a battery in there, but they installed the software, which is currently available on GitLab. Unfortunately, it only works right now with BMW Mini Cooper S R53, but they're looking for more people to get in there and help start dumping what they have. And it'll be able to pull codes, which is neat. And I'm like, but man, you can buy XYZ for 60 bucks. Yeah, but this has a lot of potential to do a lot of good. I mean, in the future, this could mm -hmm. definitely be a cheap device with a display, something like, you know, a several hundred dollar master tech for clearing codes and the like, because mm -hmm. that's when, you know, I had to buy a hunk of junk for turbo Jetta because you replace the battery. You have to clear codes in the car to get rid of lights on the dash. And it's, Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, you have to reset the steering by turning it all the way to the right and all the way to the left to get that light to go off. <laughs> I'm an Just engineering like the guy. volume up Vito. and down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the volume up and down. Yeah, in the boot. <laughs> this is a neat project. I was happy to see that, and that's something I'm going to be following because we get to talk a lot about Pi projects. It's yeah. Pretty uncommon for me mm -hmm. to go one and say, oh, we're making one of those. Then and immediately it crushed me. I was like, it only works with one car. Like, yeah. Right. yeah. So um, <laughs> that's going to bring us to an end. A uh, little bit of feedback. <laughs> I think we have two little stories, Pedro. How do people uh, yes. chatterbox our way, man? Well, there's the usual way by going to LinuxGameCast.com, hitting the contact button, filling out the form, making sure that LWDW is the thing you pick. Otherwise, we will probably feature your feedback in some other show. But yeah, LWDW is the one uh, you want to be writing to if you want your thing to be featured right here. You can also ask Jordan for relationship advice. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the thing. You can also leave us a comment on... Uh, YouTube, uh, no promises that we'll see them. Oh but, man, uh, listen, ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. I, I gave Pedro <laughs> administrator access to our YouTube channel. He lives in it. So yeah, we'll probably. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Admittedly, I've been looking at the stats a bit just because I like looking at the pretty graphs. <laughs> Pedro was just like, hey man, did you pay attention to the streaming and what our peak I was like, man, I, I use it for a free CDN. That, that's what I use YouTube for. Um, <laughs> I know how to log into it. And I know how to post videos. That, that's about it. So yeah, it's uh, the uh, the metrics. I like that. There's a, a part of my brain that likes that stuff. So yeah. So uh, last week, Frezzo uh, was watching the show, <laughs> and he says trying to catch up uh, a bit again with the LWDW and Linux Gamecast Weekly, and the latest <laughs> LWDW number one eighteen. Uh, has Jill's full screen view showing the details for some Canadian guy? Is that way? Uh, <laughs> is that your way of telling us that the two are really the same? Double question mark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you blew it, man. 
I mean, it was, it was on me. I mean, I, I thought, you know, we were going to be able to keep that under wraps, but yeah, secrets yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I noticed this. Here's the thing. This is 100% legit. Like, it had to have been over five minutes. Honestly, like seven to eight minutes into the long enough into last week's show before I realized it. Now, to my credit, mm -hmm. neither one of these yahoos realized it yeah. during all of our nope. pre-show. So, and they <laughs> no, were just looking I, at it. And I, when I picked it up, it was like, oh, that's too far to start over. We're, we're just going to cross our fingers. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> We made it four days before somebody said anything. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I noticed it when I rewatched the show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, I honestly wouldn't have noticed if I wasn't sitting here editing and clipping the show. I was like, oh, I did that, didn't I? Yeah. All right. Uh, then I thought for a second about covering it up. And I was like, yeah, we're just going to let that one slide. See who picks it up. Um, <laughs> All right. Frezzo did. Let's see. Did we mess up anything? Yay, Frezzo. Thank you, Frezzo. <laughs> uh, George, oh, ahoy. Yeah. He Slight in inaccuracy. Mm, Wayland Live ISO, he says. You confused your pop stars, Vin. Han Hana. <laughs> Hana the Montana Linux is just a customized version of Ubuntu. The Wayland Live OS is Rebecca Black OS. Black OS. Right. To which I'll yeah. retort, all humans look alike to me. Yeah. Come at me, carbon-based entity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, in fact, Rebecca Black OS. And if you don't know who Rebecca yeah. Black is, I envy you. I do. Do, do you even en envy them on Fridays? <laughs> But which, uh, <laughs> seriously, Vin, uh, which seat should I take? Seriously. Uh, that, that seat over there. Because you, because uh, again, Pedro, you don't just get children. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah. You just go down to the children's store and you get yourself a child. <laughs> Thoughts and opinions expressed by Pedro Mateus do not necessarily reflect those of a Linux Gamecast LLP. Um <laughs> I don't know, man. You could adopt Matthew from me and Steve. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Let's have Strider as a kid. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. How about not? Two Aww. beautiful people. Thanks for making this happen. We're going to bounce out of here. We'll see you next week. But uh, let's roll those credits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a scary thought. You know, yeah. in, all, in all fairness, though, I'd forgotten him. I, I don't know if I'd ever known the difference between Hannah Montana and the Rebecca Black thing, but I was like, oh, that's right. So. Well, yeah, is it possible to update? Yeah, and Hannah Montana is a pretty old kernel. Is it? Would it be possible to update it to Wayland? I can't remember what kernel it's running, but it might be able to. <laughs> you were deep and no one hates themselves that much territory, Jill. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the, the rule of thumb is Hannah Montana grew up to lick sledgehammers and Rebecca Black, yeah. well, she faded into obscurity. <laughs> Bye, chat realm. Bye-bye. <laughs>